Good morning to you. If you have your Bible out, uh, open and put your bookmark in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, please. Uh, that's where we're going to study from this morning. And, and if you have one of those Bibles that have two bookmarks, uh, you can flip over and put the other one in Deuteronomy chapter 10. So we're going to come back to that passage several times through our study. Uh, if you don't have that, then, uh, you know, surely there's a piece of scratch paper stuck in your Bible somewhere or... Uh, Tear the tab off of one of the little communion deals and stick that in your Bible. Whatever works uh, for you this morning. A uh, number of visitors with us today. We thank you for being with us. I uh, hope that uh, our worship's been profitable. hope that our study will be uh, as well. Uh, two or three things uh, before we begin. First of all, we're glad to have Devin back home. If you haven't noticed, Devin's back. So uh, I'd, I'd ask him to stand up, take a bow, but uh, hopefully everybody knows that Devin's back. So uh, had, he had a good meeting in Oklahoma. I'm glad to see him getting used. And uh, uh, he came back with a smile on his face because they didn't run him out of town on a rail. So uh, we're, uh, we're glad for the work that he's doing. Glad to have you back home, Dev. Uh, secondly, our meeting with uh, Reagan McClenney Saturday and Sunday. If you haven't taken a look at the subjects, uh, Reagan's going to speak all four lessons uh, on things having to do with the subject of grace. And uh, I, I really would encourage you to try to be here if at all possible. There's a lot of misinformation in the religious world right now about the grace of God uh, and uh, some perversions that are really very important. Uh, and uh, very dangerous. And so uh, he's going to offer some lessons on a very significant topic. So I uh, would encourage you to make sure uh, and be here uh, in order to uh, take advantage of those opportunities and invite anybody that you can as well. So hope you've had a good week. Uh, I uh, appreciate your being here. And let's study together, uh, if you would. Uh, Charles read for us from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes is one of these books that I think a lot of Christians kind of shy away from somewhat. Andrew had some comments uh, Wednesday night about Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Uh, and as you read through the book, if you're familiar with it at all, it starts off pretty easy and it ends up pretty easy and in between it's pretty confusing. Uh, because Solomon talks about all kinds of things uh, in poetic ways, some of which make perfect sense to us some of which we have a real hard time trying to filter through and understand. And, and, and even once you get to the understanding of it, uh, Ecclesiastes is just a challenging book. Uh, it, it is Solomon's search for meaning in life if you dismiss eternity. And, and that's why he begins at the, in chapter 1, as Charles read for us. And you, you run into this phrase, under the sun. Uh, if you just take away the idea of God and heaven and hell and whatever else is out there, what is it that's worth doing in life? And so he talks about a lot of frustrations in life. The same thing happens over and over. He talks about injustice, that uh, you can work hard all your life and then you die and you have to give it to somebody else who is uh, uh, not, not, not well prepared to deal with it. Uh, he talks about poor leaders. He talks about uh, kings that come from nothing. Uh, he talks about injustice. He talks about indignity. He talks about wisdom. He talks about folly. He talks about all this stuff. And, and if you just read it and, and read his conclusion, which he starts with, uh, all is vanity and vexation and grasping after the wind, you might think, well, man, this uh, this kind of a depressing book. I, I think I'll just find something else to read. But what's interesting is his conclusion in chapter 12 introduces the idea of God. Actually, he doesn't introduce the idea in chapter 12. He introduces all the way back in chapter 3. Uh, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14 may be the most well-known passage in Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man, or this is man's all, however your version reads that. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And, and we're familiar with that, but I want you to appreciate, if you go back, he says that three other times before he ever gets to chapter 12. It's almost as if Solomon looks at life and simply can't dismiss the idea that God is out there. And you can do all you want to to try to find meaning in life. You can try folly and you can try joy and you can try pleasure and you can try building stuff. But you're going to have to confront the idea that fearing God is the way to live. 
And I find that interesting because there are a lot of people not sure what life's about, uh, especially in our day and age. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Uh, we're still reeling from pandemics. There's craziness in the world. There's the potential for nuclear disaster uh, that seems to get brought up every week. Uh, we don't know about gasoline prices. We don't know if there's even going to be diesel. Uh, we, we don't know what the stock market's going to do. We don't know who the next president's going to be. We don't know what's going to happen with Congress. Uh, we, we don't know much of anything. And, and so people are not exactly sure what to do with life. And, and this is the point of Solomon's book. Let me tell you what to do. Here's what makes man man. Fear God and keep his commandments. And, 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 and let me ask you, if, 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 if in Solomon's mind that is the meaning of life, why don't we talk about that more than we do? You know, we talk about a lot of things when it comes to serving God. We've been talking this month about the concept of the church. We've been talking about being new people all year and all the ramifications that, that go with that. We've had all kinds of discussions, preached all kinds of sermons. But how often do we just say, okay, look, here's the bottom line, folks. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is what God says life is about. Well, I think part of the reason we don't talk about it more is because we don't particularly like that. Uh, and part of the reason is because maybe we don't understand it the way we ought to. So let me make a couple of observations about Ecclesiastes chapters 12, verses 13 and 14. And, and let me offer this at the very outset. Solomon, you're, you're familiar with the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon didn't come up with this one day sitting on his back porch contemplating nature. Uh, the, the king of Israel was supposed to write for himself a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. And when you write down all of that stuff, some of it's going to soak in. And, and the, the idea, the command of God to fear God and keep His commandments. In fact, I asked you to put your bookmark in Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12 says... And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and to keep, us, keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes that I command you today for your good. You, you know, that, that sentiment is, is found 15 times in the book of Deuteronomy. So if Solomon, like a good king, had written his copy of Deuteronomy and contemplated it, then he was well aware that in the eyes of God, this is what life is all about. So, let's talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, let me make this observation at the very outset. If, if man's all is to fear God and keep His commandments, then we probably need to have a better appreciation about what it means to fear God. And, and in, in my estimation for what it's worth, uh, it's probably not worth much, but I get to do the talking this morning and not Devin. Here's my estimation. This may be the biggest problem that people in our day and age deal with. That we, that, that, that we just don't have much fear of God. In fact, Paul, when he begins the Roman letter, as he's discussing the, 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 the Gentile world that he lived in, what things were like in the Roman Empire, and he, dis, he discusses all of these ungodly things in Romans chapter 1. And the fact that everybody's guilty, when he gets to chapter 3, he makes the observation in verse 18, there's just no fear of God before their eyes. And I believe that's the world we live in, that people just aren't much afraid of God anymore. The word fear in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, uh, we very often translate this reverence. And, and, and it can be translated that way. And I think for a lot of people, when we read the idea or contemplate the idea of fearing God, what we think is we need to treat God with a certain degree of respect and honor and reverence. And I believe that's true. I'm not dismissing that. But the word itself, the word is yare, and the word itself means first and foremost to frighten. The New Testament word, the, the Greek word that is parallel to the Hebrew, is the word phobio. Uh, and we're familiar with phobias, right? Uh, uh, claustrophobia, fear of tight spaces. I mean, people that have phobias, it really scares them. It's not like, okay, I have uh, triskaidekaphobia. Have you, have you ever heard of triskaidekaphobia? That's the fear of the number 13. Okay, and I don't know who came up with this one. But somebody who has triskaidekaphobia on Friday the 13th, they don't just go, 
okay, it's the 13th, and, and, and I have triskaidekaphobia, so I'm going to treat today with a great amount of reverence. People that are scared of stuff, it frightens them to death. Uh, a person that's afraid of heights, acrophobia, they're not going to get up on a tall building and walk off to the edge because it scares them to death. And that's what the word means. And I'm going to tell you, when we take this concept and, and kind, of, kind of try to soften it a little bit, well, we're not really supposed to be afraid of God. And you hear people say that from time to time. God's not a being that we should be afraid of. God is love. God is mercy. God is grace. God, God is the smiling grandfather that, that just goes, oh, you, kids are going to be kids. It's okay. Come here, let me give you a piece of pie. You know, that's the way that the world wants to think of God and we're supposed to respect Him. I'm, I'm going to tell you something, folks. We invalidate the meaning of Solomon's observation and God's command if that's the way we think of God. One of the lessons that you learn in the Old Testament is the way that people react to God's presence. And you see it over and over and over. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden after they sinned? What happens? They hide themselves. Why do they hide themselves? God asked Adam. And Adam said, well, I was naked and I was afraid. Okay, in the presence of God, a sinful man is afraid when God appears to Abraham. The first thing God tells Abraham in Genesis 15 is, don't be afraid. I'm God, but don't be afraid. He tells him that again two other times in his life. He tells Isaac the same thing. He tells Jacob the same thing. Uh, Isaiah, when he sees the vision of the throne of God, falls down and says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live a among a people of unclean lips, and I have seen God. He's afraid. He's about to die. Ezekiel falls down on his face, and, 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 and one of God's assistants, one of the angels, has to come pick him up before God can even talk to him. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that if God was standing here right now, we'd all be scared to death. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament that illustrate this is uh, Exodus chapter 19. Remember when the children of Israel come out of uh, captivity and they cross the Red Sea and it takes 45 days basically for them to get to Mount Sinai. God's leading with them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And they get to Mount Sinai and God tells them, look, you, for three days I want you to, I want you to purify yourselves and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet with you and make a covenant with you. And God descends on the top of the mountain and the mountain's burning with fire uh, and, and there's trumpets and there's lightning and there's thunder and there's earthquakes. And then God speaks to them. Can't imagine what that would have been like. But in Exodus 19, towards the end of the chapter, they, they asked Moses, said, look, would you go talk to God for us? Because if we hear His voice again, we're going to die. And Moses actually says something quite interesting to me, almost amusing to me. He says, that, it, you're right. God, God has shown Himself to you, but don't be afraid. But He's shown Himself to you that His fear might be in you. <laughs> in other words, don't be afraid, but God wants you to be afraid. And lest you think I'm misinterpreting that when you go over to the book of Deuteronomy and Moses is recounting this in Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6, he says the same thing. You came to me because you were afraid of God and God said, these people are right in what they've done. I wish they were always afraid of me this way. I'm going to tell you, folks, part of the reason that the world's in the condition it's in and I'd even go so far as to say part of the reason churches are in the condition they're in. It's because we're just not very afraid anymore of what God might do. Immorality, profanity, I mean, you name the I-T-Y sin that you want to. There's a whole bunch of them. We could, we could go through the list. What God can do ought to be a deterrent to us. It ought to cause us to stop twice and think about ourselves. 
how we think, how we talk, how we dress, how we act, how we interact, what we're like in our homes, what we're like with our children, what we're like on the job, what we're like in our influence. And, and I think the problem is that because people are so consumed with this idea that God is love, that we forget the severity of God, that we forget the lessons that God tries to teach us in the Old Testament. Why is it important to study all that old stuff? Well, what do you learn from the flood? God killed everybody on the earth except eight people. Chances are pretty good none of us would have made it. I don't know, you, you can weigh for yourself whether you're walking with God and you're on a scale with Noah. God killed those people. Children died in the flood. God killed those people. What do we learn from Sodom and Gomorrah? God killed those people. And I hear people try to argue, well, it wasn't homosexuality, it was a lack of hospitality. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If God kill you for a lack of hospitality, chances are pretty good God will kill you for sexual immorality too. God killed those people. God sent the plagues upon Egypt and killed the firstborn of, of every family and every child. God did that. God struck down an entire generation of the children of Israel in the wilderness. God did that. God allowed the Babylonians to come and lay siege to the city of Jerusalem where people were, were eating their own children. God did that. God allowed the Romans to come later and lay siege on the city of Jerusalem where 1.1 million people died. God did that. Because God is the judge and God, if He wants to punish sin, will punish sin. So when Jesus tells His apostles in Luke chapter 12, look, don't be afraid of what men can do to you somebody who can kill the body, but after that have nothing they can do. I tell you what you need to be afraid of. Be afraid of the one who has the power to take your life and then cast you into hell for an eternity. Those are the words of our Lord. And, and so when Solomon tells us, look, you need to have some fear of God, then let me suggest to you folks, we better think about what we do and how we live our lives relative to how God sees it. Because when we dismiss the reality of sin in the eyes of God, we are in a heap of trouble. Amen. Second observation. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter, I mean Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Fear God and keep His commandments. Now there's a connection here. When, when fear, in, in according to, uh, to Solomon here, ought to prompt some obedience in us. And we see this in the world we live in. We see it all the time, actually. If you looked in the New Testament in Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul makes the argument that we are to be in submission to civil government. And, and basically his argument is that the civil government's been assigned by God to punish evildoers. And, and Paul asks this question, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what the authority says. Uh, you, you, you don't know the best way in the world to keep from getting a, a, a speeding ticket? Be afraid of a cop. Not because the cop is some reason, but, but he represents law, and his job is to enforce law, and if he sees you breaking law, then you're going to get a ticket. So you don't want to get a ticket respect and be afraid of what He can do to you. We do that all the time. All the time. Every day of our life. And if you don't believe me, hop in a truck with me in the morning as I drive into the office from Lumberton and watch all the people that are doing 90, unless there's a state trooper sitting on 69, and everybody's the most law-abiding citizen you ever saw in your life. Why is that? Because fear prompts obedience. We see it with our kids, don't we? Have, have you ever told your kids, look, if you don't stop, you're going to get a whipping when you get home. Do they stop? If they've had a whipping before, they do. 
And by the way, here's, here's a little piece of advice to your parents. If you make threats and never fulfill them, they're never going to be afraid of your authority. Now, we get that, don't we? Is there anybody in the room? Shake your head. Shake your head no if you don't get it. Okay. Why don't we get that with God? Why is it so hard for even people who are Christians, when it comes to the idea of what is it that God wants from me, how is it that we can't understand that when I live like the world and I act like the world and I talk like the world and I do all these things that are worldly, how is it that we don't understand that, that this is displeasing to God and that God will punish us for that? There's a reason that Solomon said the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. Because when you understand right and wrong, you understand blessing and cursing, you understand consequences from sin and punishment, what happens is you learn that behaving is to your good. And in fact, what's ironic about that is, this is exactly what God tells us. If you looked back in Deuteronomy in chapter 6, when God through Moses tells them, look, hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind, etc., etc. Talk with your kids as you go by the way. When he gets to the end of chapter, Deuteronomy 6, verse, I don't know, 24 maybe, he, he makes this observation. You're, when your children come to you in the future and ask you, why do we keep all these commandments, then what you're going to say to them is, God brought us out of Egypt with this mighty hand and He saved us and He gave us this law, and it is to our advantage. It is our righteousness if we keep the law. There's a reason that God wants us to be afraid of Him. Because violating His law is, 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 is going to put us in a lot worse circumstance than if we're afraid of what the world can do to us. And it's to our benefit to obey. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, obedience has fallen out of popularity in our day and age. Reagan's going to talk about grace somewhat this coming weekend. I'll tell you what I've seen in my lifetime. There's a lot more songs that say, Woe is me. I am weak. I'm a wreck. I'm a wretch. I gotta have your grace, I gotta have your mercy, I throw myself at your feet. There's a lot more of that than there is trust and obey. Let's get up and march off into battle. Let's do what God tells us to do. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because it is a whole lot easier to fall down and beg for God's mercy than it is to get up and obey Him day in and day out. That's a whole lot easier especially if you're willing to swallow a little pride or if you're just willing to fake it. Oh, I'm just, you know, I'll go to church. God's going to take care of all my sins. I'll sow my wild oats, but God will forgive me. I'm going to tell you, obedience is what shows God that we really do fear Him. And fear ought to lead us to the obedience that causes good in our life. But we need to appreciate that God demands compliance. And I know we say this regularly, and I know people get tired of hearing it. This is what the world needs to hear right now, folks. This is what we need to hear right now. God's serious when He talks about husbands and wives. God's serious when He talks about how we raise our children. God's serious when He talks about local congregational responsibilities. God's serious when He talks to us about studying. God's serious when He talks to us about morality and how we deal with ourselves compared to the world. God's serious about that stuff. And here's the irony of that. Flip back over to Deuteronomy 10 if you have turned away from there. And I want you to notice something that caught my eye. And, and you see this a lot in Deuteronomy. Notice in, in verse uh, 12 again, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him. Here's the part that I find fascinating. We tend to think of fear and love as almost mutually exclusive. I shouldn't be afraid of God. I'm supposed to love God. And, and that's the way a lot of the world thinks. We, we can't be afraid of Him. We, we, he just wants us to love Him. And yet, in one passage, He tells us to fear Him, obey Him, and love Him. And, and I think that's because fear and obedience in some way lead us to love. 
Okay, well, you're going to have to fill me in on this one because I don't see how fear and obedience lead me to love. Well, think about it for a moment. When we fear God, we, we see who He is and what He can do. And so we comply because of our fear of Him. And because we comply and give ourselves to His service and to obedience to Him, what, what is His promise? Well, if you're, if you're faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. If you love me, keep my commandments, I'll, I'll take you to heaven when you die. But what we see is God makes promises to people who comply, right? And those promises are to our benefit. They're good for us. It's forgiveness. It's, it's, it's eternal life. It's resurrection. It's heaven. And so we get all of this idea that if I will respect Him, even to the point of being afraid of what He can do to me, and I obey Him, I see the goodness He can show me. Uh, when, when the kids were little, H Haley is the, the one that I remember the most, maybe because she was the first. She, she could be exceptionally stubborn. If she was sitting here, I'd say the same thing, so don't run off and go, you shouldn't talk about your kids behind your back like that. So <clears throat> she, she, would, she would just at times just get defiant, just out and out defiant. And because I was bigger than her, and that's always an advantage if you're bigger than your kids. Uh, I, I'd, I'd pick her up, take her to the bed, lay her over the bed, spank her bottom. You go ahead and turn me in. I don't care. Said and done now. I didn't abuse her, but buddy, I spanked her. And she didn't like that too terribly much. But the next time she got defiant, and I picked her up, and she knew where things were going and that I could overpower her because I was stronger than her, and I was going to punish her for disobeying, it caused her to start obeying. And when she started obeying, you know what I would do? I'd pick her up forcibly, I'd put her in a pickup truck, drive her to Dairy Queen, get her a blizzard. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. The same power that can punish was the same power that could reward and when I punished her, I, I always told her, you know, if you're a parent, you have to say this. This is hurting me more than it's hurting you. And about 80% of the time that was true. <laughs> there were times. But I tried to show her, I'm doing this because I love you, not because I don't like you. And, and she finally figured out that being afraid prompted compliance, which prompted seeing a side of me that I really wanted to show her all the time, and that was, all I want to do is good for you. I don't want to spank you. I don't want to punish you. I just want to do good for you. And when she saw my desire to do what was right and best for her, what does that do? It, it attracts you to love. God's the same way, folks. I don't know a better way to illustrate that. God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. He's long-suffering. He wants us to come to Him, but He wants us to come to Him on His terms. He wants us to be afraid of what He can do, but He wants us to see what He will do. And therefore, fearing God prompts us to keep His commandments, which brings me to the last observation, and I'll make it quickly. It is my favorite part of this study, though. Fear means fear, and fear prompts obedience, which can result in love. Ultimately, though, for me, it, it is the power of God that, that I'm afraid of that actually draws me to God. I think there is a sense in which fear is, is appealing to us. And let me illustrate it this way. If there's a thunderstorm coming through, how many of you like to sit out and watch it? I mean, if, if, you've, if you've watched people filming tornadoes, <laughs> it's always the funniest thing. Here's a tornado off, you know, half a mile away, and we're filming the tornado. Oh, oh, look at all the stuff that's happening. Oh, oh, and, 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 and the camera a lot of times will get a little closer and a little closer. 
till all of a sudden they realize the tornado's right on top of them. And then the camera's all jumping and they're all running away. Why is it that we want to film the tornado to begin with? Because power attracts us. It does, doesn't it? You go to the seashore, what is it? You don't want to go to the seashore to see the sea calm. You want to see the big crashing waves. We go to the mountains because standing on top of a mountain, it's a beautiful vista, but there's also this, ooh, man, am I way up here. Same thing with animals. With any kind of power. We went on a cruise one time. Four days of joy with my wife and boredom with life. But if they'd have let me go down and see the engines on that big old ship, now that would have appealed to me. Because we are appeal, we, we, we have a, a, an attraction to things that are powerful. And I'm going to tell you something about God. I, I think God draws that out in us. Think of Moses and all that he saw. All of the plagues, all of the miracles, the burning bush, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud. And when he goes up to receive the tablets of stone and God's finished talking to him, and, 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 and the golden calf has happened, and Moses has interceded for his people, and, and, and he's kind of talked to God into staying with them. What is it that Moses does? God, would you show me your glory? He just wants to see the being that's done all these things. And so do we all. I think that's why God's face is never seen until you get to the last couple of chapters of Revelation that describe God's reunion with His people. And it says very clearly, and they shall look upon His face. Because while God scares me in regards to what He can do to me, man, I want to see Him. I want to stand there and take in the being that has done all that He has done. Just to stand in awe and amazement and wonder and to think that He has paid attention to me, that He's listened to my prayers, that He cares about my soul, that He died on a cross for my salvation? I want to tell you what we need in this life, folks. We need a powerful, omniscient God who can destroy with His Word everything in existence because that power is the very power that's going to raise me from the dead, that has forgiven my sins, that's going to give me a glorified body, and it's going to make me be able to live forever. I'm scared of him. But there's nothing in my life that I want more than to stand in his presence. Accept it. In Revelation chapter 4, there's a throne scene where John gets to see the... the God on His throne. It, there's actually four throne scenes in the Bible. Ezekiel sees one, Isaiah sees one. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, Moses and the elders of Israel get to see God on His throne. And then Revelation chapter 4. And they all have one thing in common. Uh, the descriptions are overwhelming, but you never can see the face of God. Uh, the face is always shrouded in, in the brilliance and the glory. And as I mentioned a moment ago, when you get to the end of Revelation and, and you have the, the, the re, reunion of God and His people, it says you'll, we will look on His face. And, and I've, I've thought about this a little bit. I, I don't know if you think about these things, but I have. I, I'm curious as to what judgment's going to be like. And uh, I know we all have our kind of pictures. I mean, your picture may be a great big, you know, uh, pedestal like a judge stands behind with a gavel and God's back there. It's actually going to be Jesus, by the way, but God's back there in your mind and, and you've got a line stretching for eternity as people are stepping forward to, to, to be judged. I, I don't know how that's all going to happen. I really don't. But I've got my picture. And what I know is that 
I'm going to get to see God. And I just wonder if life is not any more than a choice as to the face we get to look at. When I get to look on the face of God in judgment, is it going to be the face of the the old father in the prodigal son story? My my child's come home, bring bring the robe, bring the sandals, bring the ring, kill the fatted calf, joy, smiling, overwhelmed with, 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 with uh, absolute ecstatic feeling because my son's come home. But there's another side to that that scares me to death. What if the face I see is the face of God watching His Son die on a cross. And I have spent my life kicking dirt on that. No regard. Got up every day and lived selfishly however I wanted to live. Wasn't the least bit afraid of God. Showed complete contempt for Him and everything He did, including the giving the best of heaven. And then I have to look at that face. Tomorrow's Halloween, you're going to see lots of scary faces around, but I'm going to guarantee you, you'll never see a face that's as scary as seeing the face of God in His vengeance and wrath upon people who have rejected Him. We get to choose, folks, which face we see. The whole of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. And every day of our life, we need to get up and remember that because we will see His face. Amen. Thanks for your attention this morning. If you're subject to the invitation, we could help you. We invite your response while we stand and sing.